All right, so we will start now. So welcome uh, everyone to this um, <clears throat> Oasis panel on the continuing pressure on big tech. I'm Mathieu Trepani, I'm CEO and co-founder of XC Horizon. I'll be chairing this session. Um, we have a very interesting group of people uh, with us today to address uh, the topic. Uh, first, Ravi Ambo, uh, CEO and founder of Sukino, a company active in telehealth. Uh, Nicolas Rambus, entrepreneur in residence, uh, Detroit Venture Partners and co-founder and CEO of Privacy Check, company active in financial, physical and reputational security. Anthony Di Orio, uh, co-founder of Ethereum and founder and CEO of Decentral, an innovation hub for decentralized technology. And uh, Jidish Shetty, founder of Quick Labs, now part of Google, and most recently CEO of Infinity Chains, um, a company specializing in ESG for uh, supply chains. Okay, so welcome, uh, welcome everyone. I'll give just a few words on the logistics. So I'll invite uh, essentially uh, our panelists to share their thoughts uh, on certain aspects of our topic and the continuing pressure of big tech and, and they'll make their, their remarks, uh, their relatively short remarks. And towards the end of the uh, presentation, I'll invite the audience to uh, ask questions directly. So you'll have the option to either grab the mic, to ask a question by a video, or to put your question in, in the chat. So please just introduce yourself and give us your name and affiliation. Uh, tell us who you'd like to ask the question to and, and keep your question brief. Um, okay, so our topic today is very rich. <clears throat> it touches on issues of privacy, of antitrust, innovation, free enterprise, free speech, discrimination, cybersecurity, geopolitics, and and many other things. <clears throat> so it should be a very interesting conversation. Uh, and so I'd like to start with Jitish. Um, <clears throat> there's been a, a, a lot of discussion recently about business models based on uh, user data. And Tim Cook famously said, uh, when an online service is free, you're not the customer, uh, you're uh, the product. <clears throat> uh, some also are very concerned that with the rise of AI models that are very intensive in data, that those that have very large data assets might have uh, an insurmountable advantage <clears throat> uh, when it comes to the use of these uh, these models, and that could, in the end, still for uh, innovation. So, um, yet at the same time, given all of that, <clears throat> um, models based on user data is, to a large extent, what's underpinning our experience of the web uh, today. So. What is your view on this? How should we think about the pros and cons of these business models? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, question, right? Uh, so there are two aspects to it. Uh, one, uh, as you rightly said, as humans, uh, you know, consumers, humans, we have gotten used to a set of internet services available for free. Example, uh, you know, search, uh, search is a great example, uh, video, consuming video. Uh, and the way this is available for free for a vast majority of consumers is because uh, of the ad tech uh, world, right? A small subset of us uh, are, are uh, seeing ads and those ads are very relevant, very uh, customized, very, uh, 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 very relevant to you because uh, our our data is is being used, and that's the reason why you can provide such custom ads, and the and the, uh, that's how the business model works. But the benefit of that is that for the vast majority of people, a set of these really really important services are available for free. So I think that in general is a good thing, right? That that's not a bad thing. A just those basic services being available. B some capabilities like Google Photos, when you use Google Photos, automatic tagging happens. You know, those capabilities can only be available for free when your data is used, you know. Uh, so so that, I think, is a good thing. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, there is a privacy, I wouldn't say risk, but there's a privacy issue, right? Your data is, is available. It is being automatically used. And some compliances that are coming in, like what we are seeing in EU with GDPR is a good balance, right? You know, clearly big tech is running a massively high margin business where it is it is one industry where, you know, you can pay for uh, these compliances. You can have this additional overhead factored in into your business model. And, and I think that is a good balance, right? Where, you know, uh, uh, companies are being 
held responsible for misuse, right? Potential misuse. Uh, they are being held responsible for uh, really being uh, very, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 taking a very uh, uh, forward-looking approach, right? Around if if some data is leaked, really communicate front, be very clear about it. So I think that's a good balance. I think there's a positive and a negative. The positive is, uh, you know, these services being available uh, at no cost. And uh, and I think the other side, you know, we'll see these compliances more and more happen even in other geographies. I think that's a good balance there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Great start. So now moving to uh, to Anthony. Um, <clears throat> We can see the discussions on the on the pressure of, of big tech, and, and there are of course many of them. Uh, in a way, we can conceptualize them as challenges to resolve, problems to uh, to resolve. Whether they're about privacy, free speech, or how can we trust information that's uh, that's out there in social networks and so on. Um, in some cases, we can think regulation, maybe legislation, can help um, in addressing that. And there's certainly a lot of activity in the U.S. and the U.K. and many other jurisdictions on on this front, but. But also perhaps we can think about business innovation and startups and so on playing a role in, in solving some of these uh, challenges, some of these problems. Um, how can we think about creating conditions that will help uh, facilitate solving some of these problems? Uh, you're on mute, uh, Anton. Apologies. Uh, I'd like to continue on this, on the problem solving definitely, but with a little bit of a tone of what, what the last speaker was talking about. Um, it, it's my belief that a lot of the business models that are used these days are actually based on a lack of problem solving and a lack of leadership that has not enabled better, more productive business models to exist rather than things like user collection information or things like advertising models, which is like the, this is the way it's always been, this is the way it's always going to be. Uh, it seems to be the standard that the industry uses. So we're just going to keep, we'll keep doing those models, but those models have consequences. And when those models have deficiencies in them, which they inherently do, like collecting information uh, and then having to protect information and in centralized systems, which eventually lead to exposure and lead to other things where people feel that they're not in control of their identity or they're not in control of, of, of uh, their assets or what it is they're doing is to me really the problem is, is lack of, of, of really sophisticated problem solvers solving to step outside of the traditional models, models that with deficiencies will eventually lead to a demise of an industry. And I see big tech, similar to where I see big finance, where I see big, big, big other sectors have used models that over time uh, will eventually lead to the demise of the way that they're, they're doing things because they're so large. They're involved in such a machine. They're serving profits and stakeholders and shareholders that they have to month after month be returning these things based on deficient models. And they didn't have the ability to foresee that these models will eventually cause their demise. So you can survive without collecting user information. I build products that do not collect user information. Privacy is extremely important to me. It's extremely important to my customers. And we just have a, pro, a policy that I don't want your information. That's yours. You can use our free products, and I offer free products without providing information, without us using advertising models. We've figured out alternative ways to, to monetize via partnerships and other avenues that when you think that the old ways of doing things won't exist anymore and that change is happening, and if you can foresee the future of trying to bring people together and being able to serve as many people as possible with better models, which you will think of if you step outside the easiness and the let's just use the, the, the typical models here. You'll be able to align better with people and people feel that you're actually creating a better service for them because they're not being extracted from. And the models that we talked about of collection of user information or models of advertising tend to turn towards extraction situations where the person is the product. And over time, those people that are providing that will feel that they're not being served and only a few are being served. And it will eventually lead to the demise of, of a particular sector no matter what that sector is, because of faulty business model based on faulty problem solving and the lack of leadership to be able to come forward principally to say, there are better ways. We're going to figure out those better ways and we're going to work towards a better situation where more people feel they're being served and that we can create winning situations for everybody and not have people feel that, that you're at odds with a company business model or you're at odds with big tech because of this extraction that's happening and it's been happening for years based on models that just frankly uh, are lazy and too easy and have been what's been accepted. So I don't accept that those are the things that are only needed with free products. There's better ways to do things. Let's work towards better models that will actually serve more people. Excellent. And that's a good segue. Now I'd like to turn to uh, you, Nicholas. Um, so if, if the private sector and if innovation can provide solutions to some of these uh, challenges, 
how do you see uh, the place for uh, startups and, and innovators to bring alternative solutions? Is there too much power concentration in the hand of, the, of some of the big techs or is, is, is there enough place for, for innovation in your view? So yes and no. <laughs> and what, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you look at the big tech today, they're the classic definition of an oligopoly, right? That's the reality. If we're thinking about data as a commodity, those players have the most, right? And they're gaining every day. And so regulation's done, you know, nothing to help with that. Uh, the reality is uh, regulators, at least in the U.S., let's call it uh, internet sphere of influence, just don't uh, have enough insight as to how to change that tide. And so that is an ongoing concern. That said, I'm going to speak at least for the U.S. market, and we can talk about other geographies in a moment. Uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, is a place of great entrepreneurship, uh, digital, right, internet entrepreneurship, as are other parts of the world. And so uh, the challenge is uh, how to fund these organizations who are trying to be insurgent and coming up with new business models that, as was said, better serves uh, consumers. Uh, and that's happening. Sorry to get a little background. It is uh, the nature of <laughs> webinars these days. Um, the good news, at least, is that venture capital funding is uh, at all-time highs. Um, there are a great number of organizations who are getting the kind of capital required to try to solve some of these problems. Um, and that's, the numbers are large, but I think we've got to be you know, very aware and help uh, balance the, the playing field, if you will, um, by some better regulation that just doesn't exist today. So my hope is in the coming uh, few years, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. We get more of that regulation that creates a better level playing field. Fantastic. And now to you, Ravi. So uh, we have discussed, of course, innovation technology, and, and we will get to regulation in a moment. But if we stay with, uh, with innovation and technology, uh, how far do you think in, in the short to medium term um, that we can push for solutions that are primarily technology driven to some of the core challenges that, that, that the industry is facing? So should we aim for tech solutions that make decisions um, maybe in identifying uh, posts that are, uh, in some definition, harmful um, <clears throat> uh, as they as they are removed uh, online, or automated loan decisions. So, just to name a couple of uh, of angles here, or should we think of technology as enabling or supporting decisions that are ultimately made by uh, by humans? Uh, you know, uh, there is a fine line between uh, decision support systems and decision making systems. Uh, and I believe we should not cross that line. Uh, with the uh, advent and usability and commercialization of machine learning and applied AI, uh, when we are doing the crunch in the cloud and the edge, uh, things are becoming way more important today in terms of how we are going about it. Uh, governance becomes very crucial. Standards become very crucial. And what types of information uh, is worked on. Uh, given the uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to harness uh, global databases, uh, you know, uh, where are uh, uh, the situations where uh, HIPAA comes into play, uh, you know, um, for example, SOC 2, Type 2 certifications for security comes into play. Uh, this is becoming way more crucial than ever. Uh, being in healthcare myself for all these years and trying to do my little thing, specifically in the area of telehealth. Uh, you know, uh, when we go into developing systems that can be feedback systems, let's say, to the healthcare ecosystem, if there are components that we're going to supply to biotech or bioscience or biopharma or pharma or even the government, there are these are very sensitive types of information. So privacy is one. Two, miscommunication is even more dangerous uh, in the sense, you know, how good is our sampling? You know, uh, how good are, your, are our sampling algorithms? What are the sets of data that we work with, that we supply? And add to that, how do we provide pertinent information to the consumer so that they're fully aware and educated about the extent of the data that's been sampled? So what are the boundary conditions that we set? Uh, to data from a data science standpoint is becoming very, very crucial. And we are, we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. You know, even, be, even if you go from the standpoint of big data, big data is 
good English being talked about for many years, but what is what have we really done with big data? I mean, you know, what have we really done with slicing and dicing, you know, important information? How have we set up the data marts? You know, how have we set up data warehousing uh, uh, frameworks or technology, so to speak, and how effectively is being information or pertinent information being supplied? This is These are the areas where uh, it's very exciting. The opportunities are tremendous going forward because technology is going to play a very, very important role, uh, specifically from a healthcare delivery standpoint, specifically from the standpoint of consumers, generally speaking, right? So from that, from that standpoint, uh, it is uh, uh, a double-edged sword. I mean, if we, if we don't bring in appropriate uh, standards and regulations, not to kind of constrain anything, but from the standpoint of how we need to deliver and share data. Excellent. Uh, now I'd like to revert back to Nicolas. Uh, so if we if we look at the regulatory side, uh, certainly there's room for uh, for thinking about certain uh, aspects of regulation here. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether um, regulatory frameworks have, have uh, kept pace with kind of rapid evolution over the past decade or so? Um, are you seeing kind of emerging agreement on how we should regulate, what kind of structure we should, and, and what should be regulated ultimately? Um, I wish I had a better answer other than no, not at all. <laughs> um, I mean, case in point, I was at Equifax when the big breach, one of the biggest breaches in U.S. history happened. And of course, you know, watch very carefully uh, the various congressional inquiries that took place. Um, and again, I'm referring to the U.S. for now. Uh, but the questions that were being asked, uh, you know, by legislators were the most basic kinds of considerations, right? Really did not understand the Internet, how digital marketing works, uh, how sometimes credit bureaus work. And so I think that's, you know, exhibit A among so many others. Look, we've all watched, you know, Mark Zuckerberg uh, supposedly grilled by Congress and he's smirking for a good reason, right? There's just not the perspective, not the insight that's required, right, to effectively uh, oversee, right, let alone envision new effective legislation. Um, so I'll suggest two things. <clears throat> One, um, Europe, of course, is, you know, out in front, and that's great to see, and it's an example, I think, for the rest of the world, both in GDPR, but also in the implementation of it, right? Uh, you know, too often laws are drafted, but there's not uh, clarity as to how they'll be enforced, right, and the penalties organizations pay. Um, and so I think that's in the right direction, not all the way there. Uh, the other thing I would, I would throw out, perhaps, as a maybe controversial topic for us all on the conversation today is maybe we should all join government, right? Perhaps as, uh, as unusual as it might sound, would, would we get involved? Would we join legislature, right? Of course, we have our perspectives, but I think, you know, we need uh, a new generation of individuals in government who have the perspective and the knowledge to effectively, right, guide where we're going. Um, I think about healthcare, and like you said, look, just only look at the pandemic and think about uh, the lack of data sharing, the lack of perspective, lack of even quality data, right? Quality data, let alone what insights can we derive from that? Imagine if we had done a much better job. We need the right people in the right places to do this beyond private sector. Okay, very good. That's a good plan. So we, uh, well, many of us, I'm sure, will join the, the government on this panel. <laughs> uh, uh, now turning to, uh, to Anthony. Uh, so if we're thinking about the role of government and maybe public-private partnerships or um, helping to alleviate some of the challenges confronting big tech today, um, in a way, we could also argue that the pace of change that we're likely to see in the coming decade is probably far faster than, than what we've seen in the past decade. So how do you see the potential for uh, staying on top of the current uh, challenges, but also the potential new frontiers of emerging challenges? Are we, are we off the regulatory side of things with this question, or are we, can this be brought back in? Because It's open. Okay. Um, on the regulatory front, I, for years, um, short-term goals or short-term objectives of, of regulations are good when they can when entities can be regulated. Um, for years now, I've seen the introduction of decentralized autonomous organizations emerging, and the ability for entities to not have jurisdiction, to not have local areas where people know who are behind them or or, or where these, these these organizations are structured. Entities made up of shareholders all around the world that are anonymous and actually don't have um, that, that have a say in the governance of, of these structures. Regulations can only apply uh, and will only be, be effective. And I mean, it could be argued whether or not they're even effective right now 
uh, when technology uh, doesn't outpace them. And, and unfortunately, there's a, or fortunately, there is a, a steep curve of technology and the movement towards systems that unfortunately down the road will not be able to be regulated. So if we're looking 10 years from now, um, and all you've seen this, we're, we're going to be in a state where, as another panelist mentioned, regulators are trying to even grasp what, what's going on here. And it's moving so quickly and so fast that they're just unable to keep up. They're unable to have the experience and knowledge and the things to even start to, to think about what's happening with these technologies next year, two years from now. So the, the idea of regulations and how that's always going to be an answer is unfortunately just not going to be the case. And I think discussion needs to be more towards when regulations uh, won't be able to be at all effective against organizations that literally are, are existing on the cloud and have no jurisdiction. It opens a whole new avenue of, of you know, what, what do we do to solve the problems that regulations are initially meant to be thinking of? And how do we work in a world where regulations won't even be able to have any type of effect down the road because of the movement and, and, and growth of these technologies that are decentralized, anonymous, um, spurring up that, that you know, how, how, do you, how do you tackle a jurisdictionless uh, company? And, and this is where my, my mind is, is always going more because um, for many of my years, it's all about decentralization, it's about freedom. And you have the opposite side, you have control. And these are two gutters in an alleyway, uh, in a bowling lane that basically are both dystopian situations, in my opinion. And there needs to be somewhere in the middle and some really good thought process about what are the problems and how do we tackle things differently to solve the problems that are actually existing. And it's not by doing the same type of things that have always been done for the, for the, for the large amount of time, because those things won't work in the future. My mind is always with regulations. How do we come together and how do we look at the problems and how do we look for new alternatives and new solutions to problems based on a knowing where technology will be 10 years from now or where things will be that you might not see in the next couple of years. We got to look very much into the future. And that's something that I'm always trying to do is where will we be five years from now, 10 years from now, where technology is all the way over here, yet regulate, regulators are trying to still cope with where technology was five years ago. Right. So how do we think about new ways of doing things to solve problems and bring together leaders and people to look where the future is and try to look at alternatives and other solutions to solve problems that may not be that hammer that's always been used by regulators because it's not going to be effective in the future. Fascinating. Very interesting. So, uh, Jitesh, now, um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of chatter uh, in the past, uh, I, I guess, a couple of years or more about in, 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 on the U.S. side about a Communications Decency Act Section 230. Uh, which essentially gives protection to tech platforms for comments that are posted by third parties in terms of liabilities uh, for those uh, for those comments. And we're seeing strong action potentially uh, in the UK. There's a bill under consideration, at least in, in, in the last version of that bill, uh, that would require uh, tech companies to police their platform in a significant way and potentially remove content that is even legal. So what is your view on, on whether web platforms should be viewed as media companies or, or should, should we keep them separate from, from media company? Yeah, I think my view on that is uh, they should not be viewed as media companies. They should be viewed as platforms, right? And then, uh, you know, you, you want to uh, have regulation around how these big companies manage the data. Do they, do they abuse the data? Do they do anything? Uh, when there's there's a data leak do they not report it properly uh, but uh, how their consumers uh, what they post i think that should be super democratic uh, and the primary reason is you know it's very hard uh, to uh, really program that and, and put some logic around what is right and what's not right right once you go down that path uh, it's it's really really hard uh, to 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 uh, uh, to put that you know into uh, you'll end up just uh, making a set of laws, almost uh, like how governments do in, uh, in a constitutional democracy, something like that. So it should be purely viewed as a platform. You know, you should allow consumers to uh, really put what they want and then give enough tools uh, so that uh, the right, I right ideas become popular, right? And apply the same logic for facts, right? You should give tools where, uh, you know, these consumers can provide feedback around what they think is factual, what's not factual but not really police uh, the, the content itself. Okay, interesting. Uh, now, Ravi, you, you have to, of course, this, this strong expertise in healthcare. Uh, and I'm particularly thinking of what's happened in the US essentially where uh, healthcare practitioners now have so much liability exposure 
and, and this, of course, was done to protect the patients, to, to, to provide the right incentives for the practitioners to provide the best care for the patients. But, but now it's turned into something that sometimes can have perverse effects where the patient experience can be negatively impacted by this. So um, how are you thinking about uh, potentially bringing solutions to some of the challenges we're seeing uh, for big tech without uh, generating some of the negative effects that, that we're seeing, for instance, in, in the healthcare industry in the U.S.? Sure. Um, <clears throat> from the genesis, from the time that I've been in telehealth with NASA being my springboard 17 years ago, uh, as we see today, we hear about telehealth every hour of every day, if not more. So to your point, uh, where I see uh, uh, video is going to be very, very powerful, way more than ever going forward. Uh, in my realm, I see Video is going to be extremely important and very powerful and many opportunities. Now, with visual analytics is one. Uh, to your point, uh, you know, what types of uh, data, uh, uh, how we harness this information, how do we encapsulate this information, uh, how do we disseminate this information becomes extremely important. One. Two, it is a one-to-many kind of a situation where the consumer can go to various different entities to uh, access information, so to speak. Uh, if this is not properly referenced, if there is not substantive information to support the, those types of information, now we are looking at you know uh, information that are inaccurate, so to speak. So to <laughs> to kind of uh, get the brass tacks, uh, you are looking at community-based networks. Uh, where you are looking at uh, full life cycle uh, health healthcare management or full life cycle health scheme, so to speak, as opposed to you know everything that is kind of discrete or ad hoc or transaction based. Um, I think this would go with maturity. So in essence, I would say that continuity of healthcare delivery in a connected network is the way that you can make it really secure from one standpoint, so to speak, it's as as uh, uh, analogous uh, in term uh, to in terms of setting up uh, an intranet with uh, extranet loops, uh, so that uh, that framework or that platform is really secure. Okay, very good. And, and Nicolas, um, there, there's been, of course, a lot of discussion, a lot of actions um, uh, on the US side with the FTC, but also in Europe and, and the UK on questions of antitrust and, and <clears throat> maybe a move to a new paradigm or, or perhaps to return to an older paradigm uh, on, on size. Uh, so, of course, a lot of the discussions on um, antitrust and market power over the past few decades have centered around consumer prices or the ability to impact uh, consumer prices. And, and now, of course, in, in the setup for big tech, where a lot of the uh, services are exchanged uh, for data, where there's no uh, clear prices. There's this, this push to, uh, to think about um, <clears throat> new mechanisms, new tools, uh, maybe to evaluate the potential for excess market power. Um, so in, in that context, do you think that we have, and, and you can take the US case or other um, uh, geographies that you may be familiar with, but <clears throat> Do you think that we have currently the right tools, the right regulations and laws to think about market power and antitrust, or we need to evolve them? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was going to say, I think we have the right laws for, for antitrust, right, for sure. And, and those, those frameworks have existed for a long time. I think the challenge goes back to the regulators to um, support them and to analyze them, and the legislators who are informed enough to act on them at the same time. And then lastly, I think, look, with all the things happening around the world, the political will of right politicians to get involved in this area. Um, you know, if, if I had to suggest what may happen, right, um, you know, there's been lots of talk about, you know, the uh, at least, you know, U.S., a digital Pearl Harbor, right, where there's some event of some kind that uh, wakes up the consumer consciousness in a way that is beyond where we are today. The reality is, you know, most uh, Americans, at least, are numb to uh, data breaches, right? They happen, you know, multiple times a day in some cases. And so that hasn't, you know, fully captured the attention, the concern 
of, of Americans. Whereas I'd say, generally speaking, in Europe, you know, privacy uh, is a cultural value, right? That is far stronger than it is, you know, here in the U.S. And so it may take just that kind of event to wake up, right, uh, Americans, uh, to lean on politicians, to uh, build structures. Uh, you know, if you think about our financial markets, the kind of talent that are around regulation there, the number of people, just the sheer volume of resources allocated to regulation. I think that's a good uh, concept for what tech regulation could look like in the future. Um, finding this middle ground or mid middle of the, the bowling alley, right? Um, but we're a long way off from that. And the question is, you know, will we require a catalyst? What will that catalyst look like? You know, there's so much going on on uh, the American scene right now. I have to expect it's only going to be that kind of watershed moment that would kick us into high gear. Um, and it'll probably happen, right? And the reality is, unfortunately, where we are in geopolitics, where we are in, you know, uh, cybersecurity and, and arguably cyber war, you know, we'll see that happen at some point in the next maybe 10 to 15 years. And we'll eventually have those kinds of structures. You know, the good news is, right, in a lot of ways, I mean, the, the capital is out there, right? I'll talk about another controversial idea. Look at the economic rents, right, that big tech earns today, and they're extraordinary, right? Apple is, you know, bigger than the GDP of Italy or Canada, right? Take your pick of, of countries. And so there's a ton of um, excess earnings, right, that could be drawn to help support the kind of regulation that we all recognize needs to occur smartly, right? Uh, and hopefully that will happen in the not too distant future before it's too late. Okay, very good. And, and maybe to, uh, to jump on that cybersecurity question, um, maybe Ravi, um, you know, of course, we, we entrust uh, companies with a lot of our, uh, of our data. Um, <clears throat> do you think that companies are doing enough or regulation and so on? Are we thinking enough about cybersecurity? And of course, that goes uh, into very tragic and very sad events that are uh, going, of course, in, in Ukraine at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so is enough being done on the cybersecurity front? Um, it's a work in process. Uh, we got ways to go. Uh, uh, that what is being alluded uh, on this meeting here, everybody's talking about the same language. Uh, you know, uh, the policies uh, need to go from a regional standpoint to a global standpoint. There has to be seamless scalability to this so that everybody's kind of reading off the same book. Because if we are not, then we are looking at an infracted situation uh, with disparate systems, with disparate uh, policies, which can be extremely dangerous. Uh, I can see that right off the bat in healthcare, where you have information sitting in a man manila folder, uh, you know, and if you lean over a desk, uh, <laughs> you can see somebody's patient record, <laughs> even today, you know, and I'm sure we are all aware of this. Uh, so where is security? And come in, if when you digitize information going into digital health, this becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, extremely, extremely important because look at the databases uh, that have been broken into, you know, patient databases that have been broken into in the last five or four or five years, you know, if not going be, you know, uh, beyond that. Uh, it is incredible. And uh, so, uh, uh uh, again, uh, like I said, uh, 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 you know, if we were to set up systems, you know, everything is kind of uh, individual uh, corporations, individual entities, entrepreneurs, when they are building their systems. Uh, and if they are like, yes, I heard, you know, leaning against the political systems to bring in these kinds of policies. But then I would ex I would really encourage and I would love to be a part of, all, you know, the, uh, 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 the technology uh, uh, world uh, to propose these standards that are very logical, uh, they're not complicated, and ensure through forums that we are speaking the same language and set up the standards and policies that are really scalable. That is the only way I see this going forward. Very good. Uh, now, Jitish, um, <clears throat> there's, there's been a lot of discussion on um, the potential, perhaps for too much regulation, potentially hindering uh, Western tech companies advance and, and uh, giving uh, kind of a clear room to grow for, for Chinese giants and, and Chinese startups uh, and so on. Um, do, you, do you share this perspective or do you think perhaps that with the recent crackdowns and in China on the tech industry, this this point has been 
uh, mitigated to some extent. Uh, yeah, can you can you say more? I, is the question that uh, is too much regulation uh, a financial overhead for big tech companies? Well, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion that uh, by bringing too many constraints, um, whether it's about policing contents and, and so on, that, that is going to stifle um, the ability of Western companies to develop um, <clears throat> prominent position in that in doing so, somebody Got else it. will. And, and so perhaps Chinese Got competitors. Got okay. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Right. As, uh, you know, uh, 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 another panelist said, right, that, you know, big tech is a very high margin business. Alphabet's EBITDA is 55 percent. So there's a lot of cash. I think uh, compliance being a financial overhead is not a problem, right? I don't think, at least for big tech companies, uh, you know, I don't think that is a problem. Uh, what I what I continue to believe is that you know, you know, advertisement the way it's done today, uh, you know, uh, is something which will stay. You know, uh, uh, economics uh, needs advertisement. Advertisement operating at this scale where you can target at the scale is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, if I'm showing, if I'm a new parent and I'm being shown diapers, uh, ads for that, that's not necessarily bad. It's, it's generally operates in aggregate, right? You know, everything where you can personally identify someone, uh, you know, we have strong regulations, uh, uh, you know, against that. But also there's no reason why big tech companies will do that, right? It's, it's, uh, they won't take that risk, even if there's, uh, there's no regulation. So I think, you know, uh, advertisement is here to stay. Targeting is a good thing when it's done in aggregate. Uh, so uh, if we are talking about at least ad tech in a private world, world, we still have to see what that means. It, it sounds great in theory. Uh, it's a, like a promised land. It's amazing. But, you know, uh, can it operate at this scale? You know, where the economics make sense, we, we have to see, right? Um, Anthony, uh, so of course, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this rapid pace of innovation that's coming and, and we can think about uh, kind of next generation genetic modification or extreme deep fakes and, and many other um, areas. Uh, what are some of your thoughts in terms of how um, the industry, how the different players can work to maintain trust of the users or maintain kind of social trust? Uh, in the face of all these uh, changes and, and that speed of, of um, uh, So my, my greatest concern in the world is the technology that's, that's being built. Um, as a technologist, as someone that has built something that uh, uh, has been quite game-changing and looking to provide people with, with the freedoms and the opportunities and the choices to remove a lot of intermediaries and, and middle layers <clears throat> from the equation between individuals and individuals interacting, um, at the same time, we built things that are, you know, decentralized and will be leading into into situations that we can't imagine um, are going to be causing more and more problems. So things are double edged swords. There's always counter arguments for things. There's benefits of, of one side of control. There's benefits of one side of decentralization and pure freedom and things out there. I'm really scared and I'm I'm scared to the point that. Um, I think this is the greatest concern the world should be thinking about is is advancements of technologies that we're not prepared for, these godlike technologies that I've been involved with with creating. And for me, my mission has always been about freedom. It's been about how can I do things that I feel that I'm in control of my life, in control of my money, my communication, my identity, things that empower me, that I can decide how to be how to kind of put that out there rather than how do I avoid being extracted from. But these models that I see on one side, as I mentioned before, pure freedom. On the other side, control. Um, we've got countries that operate with pure control, and they've um, they have the ability to utilize their technologies in ways that are maybe are helping to grow their, their 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 populations using models that they can enact inside of social media apps that are um, putting limitations on how much time someone can have in front of a screen. And as soon as you do a certain amount of time there, you're then getting fed something of education, and and they have the ability to do things that are maybe going to lead to uh, a little bit better of a better area of society than the extraction and advertising models that are leading to people that um, you know are concerned about the way that they're looking and and the the, the more eyeballs that that a, that a company can get that's where they're showing success rather than the type of people that are coming out of this and the leaders that are emerging from this so um, I'm I'm really 
frightened about where technology is heading. I'm talking four or five years when you mention things like deep fakes and the inability for people to distinguish what is truth and what is not truth. It, it can't be done right now. We're fighting against AI models that that have the ability to to learn from people and to be able to position and make changes where you're taking the people are being taken down these journeys, unsophisticated people that's leading to a more divisive world, a more world that is segmented, demented, and serving business models that are uh, creating this divisiveness and confusion and foreign powers using these models and the lack the the lack of, of or the models that a lot of American companies are using to create confusion and to be able to, from the inside out, create a situation where there is um, distrust and divisiveness. And it's really a, a horrible situation, again, predicated on business models that foreign foreign actors are, are you know, putting their hands together and going, this is exactly what we're looking for. How can we sow distrust and, and how can we spread misinformation? And how can we and ensure that uh, we're taking people down these journeys to create a, 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 a tribe of, of this people against this people to create internal turmoil. So I'm, I myself am, I take great offense to people using technologies to, to, um, to move unsophisticated people in directions that they don't know they're being swayed into. And, and as a technologist and as a leader, I, I believe it's pertinent that we come up with better ways of doing things and expose what's happening here and educate, educate people on, on how these models and how these situations leading to a world of anxiety, a world of depression, a world where, where people are so confused and, and don't know what to believe and not believe and don't know, you know, going on the internet, you can you type something in and you're being now funneled towards a result that some tech company wants you to be reading. And that could be changing the way you look at politics or the, the way that you think about who you want to vote for. And it's very powerful and our brains are not equipped to be handling what's happening out there. So I'm gravely concerned, but also an, op an optimistic person that if we can bring these things to light and work together and bring people together to create alternative solutions that are serving more people, that there's a possibility that we can step out of this. And a lot of the answers haven't been figured out yet. And I'm, we've got to work towards figuring out those solutions. It's somewhere in the middle. It's somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. And we've got to figure it out or the dystopian situations of either side are, are, are going to be what we're going to be witnessing in the future. So that's generally my call is how do we get people to think better? Think that more. Think in ways to build more humane technology, technology that's serving people and getting people into better relationships and getting people outside and not looking in front of screens and not into these new worlds emerging, these metaverses that are going to further enhance the way that businesses can extract people's attention into a world that that isn't reality. Um, and that's that's where my mind really goes to, and I'm hoping that I can have that 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 impact and bring people together to start really thinking about those things because I believe there's a better world out there that is predicated on better models and better ways to serve more people. And, and get away from these extraction models and that are that have just become too easy to utilize and to serve investors and the different thinking has to be put into place. Well, both fascinating and and very scary. So a lot a lot to think about uh, on this front. Maybe a last question. So we have about a minute and a half uh, for for Nicolas. Um, <clears throat> there's been recent action or or um, uh, statements by the FTC on the development of or rapprochement of the big tech and fintech where new payment systems are essentially providing even more information to, uh, to big tech, uh, providing deeper profiles and its ability to target and maybe closing the loop to get a full understanding of ROI and therefore more market power in the end. So um, at the same time, it's bringing very interesting developments to the financial industry. So how do you see this interplay between FinTech and big tech? Is it a good thing? Is it something we should be concerned about? Uh, dangerous has the opportunity to be dangerous. I think as underscored by, you know, so many of these areas uh, where, you know, we just don't know the unintended consequences or we're starting to see those around technology and its use um, and the business models that are out there and then overlaying that with something as critical as uh, individual's economic life or financial life. Um, that's the, the, the opportunity, the chance for a lot of bad things to happen. And so uh, I'm not saying, you know, look, I'm a technologist. I grew up with technology, right? I you know, believe in the, in the good of technology. But we also have to all, I think, as we are in this call, recognizing uh, the bad and uh, the evolution that needs to occur. So I'll say what I said earlier, which is I hope some of us think about getting involved in policy. <laughs> Super. Well, that's a that's a great word to uh, to conclude. So I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I found it certainly very uh, engaging, very interesting topic. There's a lot more discussion that needs to take place. But thank you very much for, for taking the time to uh, share your thoughts with everybody today and the uh, rest of the conference. Thank, All you. Right. Thank, you Thank you. 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 Thank you